Back in the 60s and 70s, the Isle of Arran in Scotland played host to some of the biggest names in pop and rock music history. In the early 60s, the most popular live band by far was the Clyde Valley Stompers, a Glasgow trad jazz band who predated the Beatles. Well, they sailed away out at uh, just, just like something for Hollywood, seeing, mm-hmm. sailing away into the distance. I can hear them yet. And I can hear everybody singing at, at the pier, leaving Arden tonight. And, and the guy who had the motorboat who took them to the mainland was a local guy called Bertie Teasdale. And he used, he had this boat, he did the ferry to go the island and stuff like that. But he, he took the, the stompers away. And it's one of the biggest nights that I can remember on Arden. They were hugely popular and toured with some of the biggest names in show business and had a top 30 hit in 1962. I would say we, we, there would be 14, 15 busloads of folk. Really? Yes. And up what year would this have been? Now, the, the likes of the, the dances. I mean, nowadays it's all this uh, health and safety stuff. But the likes of the dances in these days, six and a half, seven hundred folk was an average uh, Is attendance. Is that in the Lash? In the Lash? In the Lash. Oh, okay. Aye. Uh, and, and it pretty much the same in the Lash. I uh, quite and be you know. Okay, aye. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so what year was this? The Clyde Valley uh, Stompers. Clyde Valley Stompers, 19... 1963, 64... Oh, right. I was a old keeper. Yes. And uh, these uh, Sunday night raves that went on to the Monday morning dance, I remember one time uh, they were packing up about half past three in the morning and Chris Barber said to me, Old Keeper, we're going down to the pub for a pint, come and join us. And I said, well, I said, I'm very sorry, I says, I've got to clean up the hole after everybody goes. I says, because I start my work at uh, seven in the morning, you know, which the, at that time I was driving the milk lorry, picking up cans of milk. But uh, Chris Fowler, hey, Chris was a, a gentleman. It's not widely known, in fact, it's barely remembered, but in 1962, legendary rocker Gene Vincent actually played in Lumlash at the Village Hall. And we managed to track down a few people who actually saw the gig. Well, I don't remember the exact date, but in my head is 1962. And I'll tell you why I'm thinking that, because it was pre the Beatles. Yeah. That's all I remember in my head. It was pre big pop stars, it was pre big crowds, it was pre celebrity times, you know, screaming fans and things, yeah. right? 
So I'm reckoning it must have been either July 1962 or September. I'm kind of tending towards September because September weekends were the kind of times that people put things on, not, not big things like that. But um, so that, I'm kind of tending towards that. And, um, I was about 15, 16 and again that's why I'm yeah. saying it was about that, but it was pre the Beatles. Okay. Well Lamlash Village Hall. That's what we were thinking. Which, if I'm right, had a tin roof. I could be wrong about that. That my memory of it is. Plus, it was like wooden. It was. It was so packed. I mean, so packed. Yeah. I've no idea why I was. Or we were so lucky to be right at the front, but we were right. I was for here, to there, to be Jean Vincent and the group. They were up on the stage, I was standing. But I mean, I had no idea that that was wow. Do you know, it's only in reflection. How we managed to be, I reckon it must have been the boys that took us. Must have just, I don't know, got us theirs. But we were there all the time, right at the front. I just remember my sister because I wanted to, I wanted to go but I wasn't allowed because it was too young. And when she came back, you know, how was it, how was it? And she said he was a bit drunk and he fell over. So what, what happened, so, you think, about him falling? Right, well, um, he, he would stand with the, the bad leg behind him. And he made use of it in his stance and it was, it was a fantastic stand. But every so often, I think when he, you know, got rummelled up with the music, he would swing the leg round and, and pirouette, and yes. this time it didn't work. Sure, sure. That's, I yeah, that's what happened. I was just seeing you doing that, it didn't work and he fell. Right, yeah. But um, it seemed to be part of his act. When he fell, he just carried on playing. It's terrible to laugh now. Yeah. I've got a very clear picture <laughs> of the guy to the right of him who who just <laughs> it's a terrible thing to say and whilst I was aware at the time that he had a bad leg I didn't really know the full history of it or how bad it was I mean when I you know like sort of in later years found out the history behind it. how he was even standing was it was amazing because his his leg was sheathed in metal from above hip to to ankle and i i thought the stance was just part of the you know the rock and roll stuff, which it probably was in a sense he yes he utilized it and he was dressed from neck to toe and tight black leather, you know, as a 15, 16 year old girl, this was brilliant. And um, and I mean, he moved about, when, especially when he did Bebop Blue Lab, which I mean, the place just erupted. Very few people still remember the Gene Vincent gig. Well, it was 60 years ago, almost. And the general account seems to be that maybe Gene wasn't on top form, and maybe he had too much to drink before the show, and it was a bit of a disappointment. During our research for the show, we met Jim Henderson, 
Jim's an Ayrshire man who now lives in Canada, and he sent us a completely different account of what happened. Hi Ronnie, this is the story I have to relate. It's all true, as sure as my name is spelt James. I was around 19 at the time. Aaron was the mecca of live music in Scotland, and many teenagers came over from Ayrshire with just beer money and roughed it on the beach or wherever they could find shelter. That night, when Jean was about to appear, there were almost a thousand people in the hall, and a support band started the night. When it was time for Jean to appear, there was no sign of him, and an officer was sent to find him. He was found in a White House bar. Now, the White House is a hotel that used to be right next to the, the hall. And there he was, imbibing in a glass or two, wondering why he was hired to appear in a remote country village. Once he was encouraged to head for the village hall, on entering the stage, he was dumbfounded at the size of the audience and hastily formed his band and set to entertaining the crowd. And on finishing his set, there were many shouts from the crowd chanting for more and he actually sang for almost an additional hour. Good times. Nothing resembling this happened today. Cheers, Jim. Throughout the rest of the 60s, there was a who's who of famous bands playing at the dances in Arran, including the Yardbirds with Jeff Beck and again with Eric Clapton, Unit 4 Plus 2, The Equals, The Kinks, Dean Ford and the Gaylords, who became the Marmalade, The Animals, The Searchers, Marsha Hunt, Kenny Ball and his Jazzmen, Johnny Kidd and the Pirates and many more. From the early 70s to the late 70s, it was still a hot spot for touring bands, especially on summer holiday weekends like the Glasgow Fair and September weekend. And now that discos were more popular, you could have a live band and a disco on the same night. Of course, Arran wasn't just a popular destination for pop bands. There was a big audience there too for folk music, and big names like Billy Connolly and the Corries were also regular visitors. Slade played there many times, as did Thin Lizzy, Nazareth, Tear Gas, who were later the Sensational Alex Harvey Band, and a few years later, bands from the punk era, like the Rosillos and the Lurkers. Some enterprising young men started to form band agencies, like the McNaughton Brothers, who went on to open a record shop chain in Glasgow, Listen Records. And my old friend Jimmy Moon, who with his friend Jack Moroy brought over bands, hosted a disco and also ran a cinema for the holidaymakers. We booked the bands and put on discos. And we had, at one point, in the height of the summer, we were doing nine dances and three cinema shows. Across all three halls, Fighting Day, on Marsh and Brody. Which bands do you remember seeing Joe when you were in the halls in the back of the day? I saw uh, the Kinks, the Yardbirds with Jeff Beck. Well, I was over from Glasgow that weekend and I saw them in the last show with Jeff Beck because I remember it was, it, a year it was a year heartful of soul was at number one. Yeah, he was playing slime with that, you know, and, 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 and Anna, a copper pipe. And definitely Jeff the other one. ones were as uh, Unit 4 Plus 2, Dave Berry. What would have been one of the earliest ones you'd have seen? And when would that have been? That would have been... Uh, 65, 66, mm -hmm. and it could have been. I mean, all that seemed to happen at the one time. You know, all the Unit 4 plus 2, the Kings. Mm -hmm. Find out what year the Arbors were at number one with Heart Full of Soul, and that was the year that it was all, because they were definitely, they'd just gone to number one, yeah. and they were playing on Mash Hall, which seemed absolutely insane. I, I know, it's Slave, a couple of Slave, times. Yeah, they did the summer season, too. They, they, um, they, they were came, regulars, weren't they, really? They came early as Ambo Slade, and then as oh, Slade. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they were great. No complaints about any of them. A lot of the raves were on a Sunday night, actually. I think they had to finish at midnight on a Saturday night, so they didn't run into the Sunday night. Oh, yeah, and you could be really sense. late on a Friday night. But I'm sure a lot of them were on the Sunday night. But Lamash got the... they got all the raves. 
There was no raves in Pint Bear product. They, they, they got all the Yardbirds, all the Kinks and all of them. I think the last show might have been bigger as far as not really, I've no idea how it worked that way. Because it, yeah. I mean, it was very little stewarding in those days. It was usually just a couple of local guys that would, that would do the door and make sure there was no real trouble. But you know how you mentioned the animals there? I've got a kind of funny feeling that that is accurate. I, I think it's so. It's just well. kind of yeah. coming to mind. I can see, um, what's his name? Is it Eddie uh, Burton? I can see Charles Chandler standing there. All of a sudden, I'm the one I'd forgotten all about. The White House Bar that Jim mentioned was the bar of the White House Hotel, which used to be in the same field as the, the Village Hall, but is long gone. And one would have imagined that Jean would have stayed there but we found out that he actually stayed at one of the council houses across the road from the hall with the McDowell family. It was common for local people to accommodate bands in the 60s and 70s and Mrs McDowell's house was only a few minutes walk from the hall which would have suited Jean. Just say the hall was right the, here? Yeah, that's right. So actually, this is that photograph we got of the hall, that's where, that's where the photograph is taken because that, that's the backdrop of it. Yeah, it was probably about there. Stage was down that end. Oh. This was the length of the hall. Basically, right. this, this footprint. You know, there was nobody to upset. You know, the park terrace over there, you know, which the, the trees weren't quite as big during that period. There was a hotel in there called the White House, which is, which is long gone. Generation past that. Yes. Uh, well, the bands I've seen, uh, I'm a 70s kid, so it was the Rizzolos, the Rivellos, uh, Albert Lee, and the older side of the tail. All right, yeah. You know, like a living room. Right, know, sure. Packed. Yeah, yes. Uh, so I'm Pete Wingfield, was, was playing keyboards for really? them. Yeah, all yeah. That, all that kind of stuff, you know. I can't remember the bass player, the drummer's name, but they were like big time session guys as well. I'd like to say hello to all the listeners of Radio 1, be it in your car, your office, how you all do. Wait, wait, wait. The water boys played in a tent in the back of the school, it was like a big top thing. Right at the height of their career. And uh, they came in this big top thing, set a stage up on it. And, uh, Phenomenal night, absolutely fantastic. Oh, this was right at the peak of their career when um, I can't remember the name of the album, was it, This Is You See or something like that. Oh, right. Uh, uh, you know, right at the peak, they were absolutely phenomenal. Uh, wait, 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 we're in the exact same position with the Radio One Roadshow. They came over and they done a, a gig and it was a Monday afternoon or something like that, and I think the whole island was there. It was just a phenomenal day out. Right, you know? sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's kind of an area of the big bands that came to see. Oh, right. oh, well. Aaron is still a fantastic place to visit, but no longer part of the circuit for touring bands, unfortunately. Over the years, there have been one off festival type concerts, notably the Waterboys in 1990 and Wet 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 in 1992. 
And more recently, uh, we have the two Tams to thank uh, for bringing more great music to the island. Uh, that would be Tam Balak and Tam Skinner. But the glory days of hundreds of people packing the village halls at weekends are gone. Hopefully not forever though, for Lamlash Hall may have been demolished, but the other village halls in the island are still in use, and who knows, it might all start up again. White face, black shirt, white- 